lot, the presenters are not going to have to wait for the, the line to go back down to get to it. <laughs> they, they're going to be able to respond. Okay? As when they finish, we're going to ask you to input. Okay? Because we have a lot of artists here that are inspired by Monk and their work. And you need to hear it because they have a story to tell as well. He was here, he came in from California for the opening. He went home and he came back. Okay? That's commitment. Thank you. <laughs> Brian Broadway. He's from Texas. He was here for the opening. We have an artist from Miami. You, you see the, the wood uh, hanging sculpture piece around the corner here. You know what happened in Miami. So you can imagine what he went through to get that work here. Okay? We have artists here from Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Virginia, Maryland. And one of the things that I really like about this exhibition is that we have a variety of mediums. Myra, please speak about your piece. Okay. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. So it's a quilt. Um, I made it for this particular show, and usually when I do, when I'm asked to be in shows, I like to do a new piece. So I had been traveling quite a bit this summer, and I told Ed I probably wouldn't get it to him until the last hour, which happened. But um, it's called Blue Monk in My Dreams, and my husband and I are real, I, we love jazz. My son's a musician. I played the trumpet um, throughout my whole um, grammar school and into high school, and so, um, so, and we do jazz programs every Thursday in the summertime in in the park um, with all different jazz greats that come through. We've been doing it for 20 years, so uh, jazz is really important to me. But this piece. Um, Thelonious Monk was special <coughs> to me, and I felt like his spirit was was kind of channeling me when I was making it, and I felt that I was connecting to the Egungun uh, costumes, and so it comes across as that. Um, I was asking T.S. here if uh, if, if it was true that that the TSM stood for time, space, and motion, <laughs> and um, I said because I heard it from one of the one, one of the old guards, uh, jazz musicians, and he said, "Well, I never heard that, but those are the kind of stories you would hear from about Thelonious Monk." And so, in doing that, it's a strip piece. It's very traditional. I usually don't use African fabrics in my work, um, although people have argued with me and said, yes, you do. <laughs> but what I, what I try to do is, and the reason why I do collect African fabrics, I love African textiles, but what I do, I try to do is, I try to imagine what my ancestors felt like when they came here with nothing but what they were wearing, and they had to recreate what it was that was African to them, and so that's what I that's what I do. Um, there's in the in in the quilt you'll see an Adinkra symbol, and it's it, it guards against jealousy. And I'm sure um, Elder Monk had to keep certain folks away from him, <laughs> and, you know. And I'm sure he did it through his music. I I. I believe, in my mind, that he was very metaphysical. And, um, and then in the right-hand corner, there's cowrie shells. And there's always some cowrie shells in my work. And I have them. It's, it's the, um, the uh, a, a gungun symbol um, 
in the right hand bottom corner. So that's basically what it's about. Those fatigue fabrics from Bali, and there there is a patch, a couple of patches of African um, fatigue, but basically everything else is fabric that I brought here. <coughs> consultant and curator. In 1980, Dr. Myra joined the team of the Crown Heights Youth Collective, founded by her husband Richard Green in 1978. Almost a, de uh, almost a decade later, together, they co-founded the Collective Fellowship and Peace Academy, where she served as principal, educating their four children and a host of others until they were ready for, to attend college. In 2008, Dr. Myra was appointed the prestigious position of Distinguished Lecturer of Art and Arts Advisor to the Dean of Humanities and the Arts at City College of New York. And that's keeping it short. <laughs> special and spiritual tone. And to do that, we have Brother Dick Griffin to do something very special for us. Dick? Oh, okay. While he's doing that, Dick Griffin is a master trombonist known for his work on Strata East Records and with Rasan Roland Kirk. Dick Griffin is recognized for his trombone playing technique of circular, circular phonetics, phonics, and combining phonics with circular breathing. He taught music theory and the history of jazz at Westland University. Dick's paintings have been exhibited nationally and internationally, and he has exhibited in all three Salonius Monk exhibitions. <laughs>
sul nome. singer and they were rehearsing 
around about midnight. My question to you as a singer is how do you approach dealing with singing to most music? Well, I said to myself, what am I going to say about the Holy Spirit? The word original has been overused. And I see his music as something beautiful, something unheard of, something wonderful. And with that feeling, that's, that's how I approach his music. So I'm going to do a little bit something for you now right. with my friend here. And I don't have many stories because I like T.S. stories about old you know, He'll tell you about that. <laughs> Wow. 
opportunity to actually play with mom. And now you're wearing two hats today, as a musician plus as a painter. And when you get a chance, the painting over on the other side with that bright colors, reds in it, there's an album that's embedded in the painting. Tell us your monk overview, your monk story, or whatnot, but please tell us about that painting. <coughs> okay. I, I, I can say I shared the bandstand with him on this. I didn't actually play on the bandstand with him. At, uh, when I came, came to New York in 1967, I started playing with Rossan Roman Kirk. And there was a club, uh, there is a club in New York called the Village Vanguard. And the Village Vanguard would book two bands um, during three weeks before Christmas and three weeks after Christmas. And it would be Thelonious Monk and Rossan Roman Kirk. But it gave me the four years, the last four years of the performing time, the time to spend that time in the dressing room, in the kitchen, with him, uh, just in silence sometimes. And in the moment, you know, like he had something to tell me, he would, he would come over and kind of talk to me, and, and you know, like he would like to give me a secret. He'd get over there and say, now look, let me tell you, you're making a record. You've got to make sure you make a good record because it's going to be here longer than you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then he'd say, you know, he said each cut on the record is like a chapter in the book. And, and you know, and, and a lot of times, but I, I shared it with Randy Weston and he talked, a lot of times we wouldn't say a word to him. He would just walk and, and I was just, the energy was there. As, and I know his son can attest to that. And uh, I know he passed the story that, that uh, Randy said he came over to the monk, the longest monk's house for the first time. He was there two hours and the monk didn't say a word to him. <laughs> and after a while, he said, okay, Mr. Monk's nice visiting you. He said, yeah, come back. <laughs> and then the next time he came back, he said, Mr. Theologus, we'll sit down and play two hours for him and I'll stop. Wow. He, he, he was a, I can say, I got so much inspiration from Theologus and, and the energy that he passed through you without saying something was so great, I, it's kind of hard to explain that. So, I, I, and I, and I, I didn't actually perform with him, but I, I missed an opportunity when uh, my friend Charles Stevens was able to do the, the octet. And uh, I was busy doing something, and uh, uh, Paul Jeffers was contracted and called the guys up to play with him. But I, I did, I mean, my spirit was there with him. And uh, all of that said that uh, I, I kind of like, um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to tell you this story, and this has to be done with the form. It's, it's, it's all part of my first encounter. <laughs> so, in the dressing room, or in, what in the dressing room, in the kitchen, <laughs> in the kitchen of uh, the really fan guard. And I, and I have to say this, I'm not making myself different or any better than that. I didn't smoke a drink, so uh, do anything, get high. So all I did was sit back in the kitchen, holding my horn, waiting for the next set. And the other guys out there were doing what they had to do. And normally, it was just you know, taking a smoke break or what. So I was just sitting there on my horn one day, and, and, and you know, the moment was walk, walking like he hung the walk, and he walked, and he, he walks and he walks and he's like he's thinking. He's just kind of pacing. But then one day I did this. He stopped. He said, "Do that again." <laughs> and he smiled. He had a way of smiling. And when he likes something, he'll say, "Yeah, check it out." So after that, we had this routine. He would be walking in the kitchen. It's pacing. He'd be walking, and every time he stuck his hand out, I had to play that. <laughs> yeah, play that. And, really, and then he would, he would, he would do like he bit his teeth and say, "Check that out." That's <laughs> real as it can be. So that was my act. So I can tell you, if you want to call that playing with the Romans, I can call it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 
still enough. I think I've covered a few things. So. We'll come back to your paint. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> when, when the team was sitting down talking about the artist talk, one of the things that we were saying was we want to have some input from various mediums from, and from various age groups. And Angelica Athena, my family member, introduced me by email to this next presenter, T.L. Cross is an award-winning singer, songwriter, producer. LeVar Wilson, a.k.a. T.L. Cross, is a disciple of hymns and books. In a tree-lined block in Laurelton, LeVar Wilson is slowly building his flock of fans as hip-hop soul artist T.L. Cross. Tone. What do you mean? <laughs> Using the pious principles that he learned as the son of a minister. Before he struck out on his own as a solo artist, Tone wrote and produced tracks for artists such as Diddy and Usher. Tone was the wordsmith behind the 2000 hit Get It On Tonight by artist Montel Jordan. And the headliners he has worked with include 50 Cent, R. Kelly, Yolanda Adams, Mary J. Blige, and Kelly Price. Tony. T.L. Now, this is T.S. Yes. Now, is T. yes. yes. <laughs> and T.L., if you're a giant fan, we know who T.L. is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And if you're into the music, and it was uh, T.L.D., Long Tall Dexter. <laughs> so where does this T.L. come in? Man, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Angelica Bina for, for, for writing such an amazing bio for me. <laughs> Put your hands together, please. This is amazing. very simple, at least for me. Um, the L comes from my first name, LeVar. The T comes, hey, the T comes from my middle name. So it's, oh, so I stand. Yes. Oh, I stand. Okay. As yeah. sharp as he's looking, he should stand, right? <laughs> Can you see me now? Yes. Okay. So the, uh, the L came from my first name. That's first. The T came from my second name, which is my middle name. That's L and T. Crossed. I just crossed them. T L crossed. This is that simple. Not that deep. Okay. <laughs> now I was listening to your CD, Best Kept Secret. Yes. Love is a hustle. Yes. Now you have to go and go online and listen to his music. He's old school. He's so young, but he's old school and so smooth. Oh. <laughs> I, I, really. I'm, I'm not just making this up because he's here. What, what, what's your inspiration? Well, my inspiration, you know, being a son of a musician and being from a musical family, uh, you know, the inspiration was right there in the house. You know, my, my parents are from New Orleans, Louisiana, who they call, they, they call the place the birth of jazz or whatever. So I got a lot of jazz in the house, a steady diet of jazz. I was introduced to Thelonious Monk's music through my dad, through Angelica, and through a very good family friend, Ms. Adele Tucson. And in listening to his music, well, this is where I got my inspiration from. Um, we were talking about philosophy a little bit, a little bit earlier. Listening to Monk's music gave me inspiration because the philosophy in it, for me, was this. Two things. One, as we sit around and we're looking at all of these paintings and all of these great artists, Monk, to me, painted the line between intellectualism and humor more thin than anyone I have seen. Well said. All right. Well said. Now, now, the thing about it is they don't really have to be separate. 
intellectualism in humor, because we all know some intellectuals that take themselves so seriously until it's humorous. <laughs> but, but, or we know some comedians, like let's say Richard Pryor, who's actually intellectually brilliant, you know, but using comedy. And I feel as though Monk made me see, philosophically, you know, that, that it doesn't actually have to be uh, 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 different. They could be one and the same. The other thing was, the other philosophy that inspired me through his music was Monk also painted the line between beauty and dissonance thinner than anyone I have seen. Almost to the point where it is the same thing, finding the beauty in dissonance, finding the dissonance in beauty. Because I heard him play songs that were beautiful, but still found some dissonance there. Is he talking about ugly beauty? Ugly beauty. <laughs> Absolutely, ugly beauty. And that's a perfect example. But the, but the philosophy with me was I found something that actually spoke to my life. That's exactly what my life is. Every time there's beauty, there's always some dissonance in the background. And every time there's dissonance, there's always some beauty in the background. And that was, uh, that, that's my inspiration, the lonely smoke, and that's why I'm here. All All right. Right. We're going to let Dr. Jeffries catch her breath. <laughs> T.S. Monk is a musician, drummer, composer, band leader, teacher. T.S. Monk joined his father's band and toured with his dad until Lawrence Monk's retirement in 1975. Is that the correct date? In addition to the commitment to his own musical journey, and the proliferation of his father's legacy, T.S. Monk is dedicated to sharing music universally, especially African-American classical music. T.S. Monk. Uh, you know, I listen to everyone here and how they feel about Thelonious. And I say to myself, wow, it's really weird, because though I'm his son, I basically feel the same kinds of ways. You know, there was a, I went through a transition from son to fan. <laughs> everybody assumed how, well, really, everybody assumes I would be a fan, but I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> I did not know what he was doing, and I had, actually, I had an epiphany when I was 19 years old where I discovered, I won't take you through the story, uh, but I discovered that the guy that was in the room next to me was Thelonious Monk, <laughs> which, which never registered to me because people used to say, well, do you know who your father is? <laughs> right, so I'm saying, daddy, <laughs> straight up, you know? And uh, I didn't know, you know, Art and Max and Sonny Rollins and Horace Silver and, Miles and all these guys that were coming to the house for a long time. I didn't even know their last names because you know everybody knows. You know your father has friends. When you're a kid, daddy has friends, and daddy might be friends with Fred down the block. You don't really know what the hell Fred does. He's not friends. Daddy's friend. So um, it's it's uh, it's been an amazing journey for me uh, in life, and I know we want to get this conversation started so but I do want to inform all of you of a couple of things that that are real important especially in light of your performance which was absolutely fabulous <laughs> I, I, you know it's Thorny's centennial birthday so you know I did a Google search because I was thinking about how for instance every young jazz musician today you know when they do their first CD they have to, they feel compelled to have a monk tune there because if they don't have a monk tune there, nobody's gonna take them serious, <laughs> you know? So in light of him as a composer, I said, um, you know, let me Google, you know? I said, let me go to Google and find, you know, the Thelonious must be somewhere there on the list of like top composers at this, at this juncture. I said, I know Duke's gotta be number one, uh -huh. you know? So I Googled, Number one all-time recorded composer in jazz, and 
voila, it was in fact Duke Ellington. However, the guy that they said played the piano wrong, the guy that they said didn't make no sense, the guy that they said played all the wrong notes, the guy that they said was spinning around on the bandstand like a nut, is now the number two all-time recorded composer in the history of jazz, the longest month. You know how Google is. You Google one thing, you gotta go with something else. Right? So I said, well, wow, man, if he's doing that well as a composer, how's, you know, like, what's the number one recorded tune in the history of jazz? So I Google that. Right? And I said to myself, it's got to be sophisticated ladies, you need to go take a day train. It's got to be Duke. Well, for all you monkites that are here today, and I know everybody here today is a monkite all the way. Round it round. Uh, this year is now the number one most recorded composition Ooh. in the history of the Dr. Rosalind Jeffries is an art historian, teacher, author, lecturer, and activist. For over 60 years, Dr. Rosalind Jeffries and her husband, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, have walked with African peoples and our great culture. The walk has spanned more than 25 African countries and hundreds of African leaders. The highlights are many but her experiences with Alex Haley and Roots, Dr. Coretta King, Dick Gregory, Dr. John Henry Clark, ASCAP, the, uh, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, and the National Council of Black Studies, and her projects in Ghana and Ivory Coast are her great loves. Dr. Jeffries received her BA and MA from Hunter College, and her PhD from Yale University. Uh -huh. Dr. Jeffries. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to talk about people who are outside of the box, <laughs> and are extremely talented and seems to listen to another kind of voice that's a high spiritual voice or else a voice that comes from the ancient part of us that's really created. And we know that to be part of our history because before modern art, when we were doing what they call crazy quilts because it didn't follow a systematic little formula that they had, they end up calling it crazy quilts. And say, certainly with the graveyard decorations too, they thought we were crazy, but we definitely had a system and the operation of signs and symbols that was very ancient and old. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about dealing with sounds, we too as an African people come from some primordial things that are very, very fascinating <laughs> that makes us think of the innovations of Theolonius uh, Monk. Uh, down in South Africa, there's a system of walls. So ancient, says, saying that it's 200,000 uh, BC, and that those walls are so extensive until they go from South Africa into Mozambique, crossing um, uh, Zimbabwe. A huge stretch going through three countries, and they're recently finding out because of satellite photography that those walls were not for just corralling animals, but that they were sound chambers, dealing with sound and innovative, unusual energy. And so that the new sciences are bringing forth things. At Harvard University, they have discovered that with each note, they're blasting sand, uh, a sound into sand. And each one of those notes 
brings up a kind of kaleidoscopic uh, pattern. And I even had a little sample, and we're calling that new art uh, cymatics. And they're relating it to Nicholas Tesla. These are the patterns that come from sound, taking sound, different sounds, and blasting them into the sand. These are the patterns that form. And so with these ideas, we realize that modern art began with people like Mondrian, who had a different sense of sound, and where did he get it from? His known work is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. From hanging with blacks, listening to jazz, he created modern art. And so therefore, we know that patterns are so extremely important. And they were talking about these sounds as being related to the work of Nikola Tesla, who has access current that can go through human beings and you continue to live, as opposed to direct current, DC current. And you get involved with DC current, that current hits you, you die. And so with the sound phenomena, unusual things, we have to go back and look at Phil Coran, who was a great jazz musician in Chicago, and he got sick and was in the hospital, healed himself with intonating various sounds. We have to remember Al Smith, because Al Smith in the 60s, he's the, the chair of the department of Howard right now. But um, we remember that when he was creating sculptures, he would put strings in certain places or little spots where you could blow through so that you could tune yourself up every morning in the sculpture that you purchase. So that sound is very phenomenal. So that when a uh, Thelonious Monk was playing sprayed fingers with the fingers coming out, and they said, well, what kind of crazy man is this? You know, because you know, those of us who were taught piano when we were kids, we were taught to get the power out of the point of the fingers. And here he was doing it with splayed fingers before the era of cell phones where we taking our finger and hitting it on splayed fingers on the cell phone. So that we must be careful about people who are coming from a different point of view. Another painter we know trained in fine arts was George Washington Carver. And we know about him, they said he was crazy because he got up in the dark and he talked to the plants as the sun was coming up. And so that this is what we mean about our geniuses. We have to watch out from them, for them when they're coming. Oh, what a wonderful thing. As Now you didn't tell, have to tell me about my time. <laughs> sound that's coming, the sound of lightning or the sound of thunder. We know the color scheme of the red. Uh, you say yama ya, and we hear in our hearing the waters and the turbulence of the water or the conch shell that's going through. By the way, South Africans, uh, as I was mentioning the South Africans, uh, they started to build patterns in their art. So, or oh, here was a, a, a quick photograph of an aerial view and showing you the uh, electrical scientific current. Showing you an aerial view looking down satellite on those walls. And so therefore when we hear too, Joshua did the Battle of Jericho and the sounds of the trumpets went forth and the sounds of the stamping of the feet and the calls and the shouts that went out were the cause of the wall that came tumbling down. And so that our God, uh, that's so magnificent and awesome, uh, knows about hitting what knows to, to, to you know, the operas get the, the glass, you know, and they hit the right note and the glass shatters. 
So to these ideas of sound throughout, so whether I speak Bible to you, or whether I speak, speak modern art to you, or whatever, we were people who were designed to hear with our hearing and to see with our seeing. So that that's the a realm you have to be in. And so that if you are uh, uh, out of the box, then you can hear those things. If you're in the box, you're still growing. If you're growing. Know, that shows him walking on the water. So we, with this, graphic symbols on the walls as a contemporary uh, continuation. <laughs> The 200,000 BC. Don't let me I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. Because we talk about, matter of fact, Randy Weston, in his, in his book, The Autobiography of Randy Weston, African Rhythms, he talks about color. He talks about yellow. He talks about blue. You, not, you, got, you got to read the book. But we have the professor here. Now, then, I was watching a, U a couple of YouTube um, videos of Thelonious Monk in concert, okay? In Norway, Denmark, Paris, London. And I'm into Monk. And him standing, doing his movements. But I didn't notice until I watched those videos how he's dancing, sitting down. Because if you look at his right foot, and he's not, and it's not because he's pedaling, but he's, he, it's like he's dancing with that right foot. Now, take us to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Those color forms that I told you about from the Yoruba and the sound, there were also dance movements. So that if you're talking Yemaya, then you have undulations as the water flows and moves, there's a certain amount. So the color scheme and the numerical vibration, the sounds, and all of those go together. If you're talking Shango, then there's the sound of the thunder that I meant too, but there's also you know, um, our Shango dancers do this, you know, pull those elbows at the sharp diagonal lines. Uh, then if you're talking Ogun, Ogun is a little ting, 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 metal, hitting metal. It's, uh, you have sound again, and then uh, sound, uh, ma masculine uh, from the earth, from down where the metals come from, there's something like that again. So why not sit at the piano? Why not sit at the piano and then have your body in tune with what you're saying? For we know that psychodynamics of the entire somatic system of the body has its own synchronization. validates what uh, Dr. Jeffries has just said. Two things <clears throat> about Thelonious. Uh, there was always a convenient misnomer about Thelonious spinning when he would get up uh, from his piano and actually let the, the, uh, <clears throat> let the, the rhythm section and the soloist play minus the piano. First of all, that was innovative and cast out of making records 
with Dr. Fiano as a result of Polonius doing that. But that spinning, I've come to find out, is actually, you know, there are many things that we African Americans do instinctively, and we don't know exactly why we do them, but we do them. And it's, it's part of the Africa that's still in us 400 years after so many of us were kidnapped. Uh, and that spinning that Thelonious did, you know, Thelonious was only one generation out of slavery. You know, we have to remember people in his generation were just one generation out of slavery. And so a lot of the African traditions that were practiced by the slaves when master wasn't looking came forth in their children. And that the spinning that Thelonious was doing is actually a variation on one of the most ancient of African dance steps. But it's, you know, it, it was convenient, um, and I, I want to say this properly, it, it, it's convenient sometimes by the ruling class to attribute things by the, to, to attribute characteristics of the underclass as a function of some instinctual, primal, function that's not rooted in some intellectual uh, 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 basis. You know, it's that old thing, you know, like, uh, oh, they just do that, right? They don't have to practice or they don't have to study. They just do that naturally. Well, it, 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 it's, not, it's not true. And so that ancient, the, there are ancient dance steps that we're doing right down to today right down to today that can be traced, for example. Can be traced back thousands and thousands of years. That's number one. So uh, definitely the, the, the dancing that we do, there's a spiritual component to it that goes back to our ancestors, absolutely. The most interesting thing he said was, we talk about that splay sort of way Thelonious played the piano. Now, our European musicologists would attribute that to a lack of knowledge on his part as to how you play the piano. Mm -hmm. And the great uh, <clears throat> jazz pianist Bill Evans was once asked in an interview, and it's in print, you can look it up, uh, you know, why is Monk so different from everyone else? And he said, well, it's obvious that he had that he has had no real uh, uh, interaction with European classical music, okay? Now dig this. Thelonious' first music teacher was concert master for the New York Philharmonic, who used to run around and brag that he had this little black kid with this odd name that was extraordinarily proficient at playing Mozart, Handel, Bach, Haydn, Schubert, all of them. And you know you cannot play those guys with played fingers. So obviously Thelonious, as all geniuses do, because we know that genius is 99% hard work, did his homework. Yeah. And once he did his homework and learned how to play the piano according to the European musicologist guidebook, then he got involved in jazz and jazz is about, what do you got to say? Who are you? And so as a result, Thelonious then was mentored by Jelly Roll Morton, by Duke Ellington, by Willie the Lion Smith, by uh, Art Tatum. So he learned how to play stride, like those guys, which you can't really play with splayed fingers. But then his generation, a musician said, we really got to figure out how to be ourselves. And so everybody went searching for their own, their, absolutely their own sound. And that's why we have Miles, and we have a Coltrane, and we have a Art Blakey, and we have a Roy Haynes, and we have a Dexter Gordon, and we have a Sonny Rollins, and we have a Dizzy Gillespie. Woo! All those people are individuals. And Thelonious, and this is what, what you said, this is why it hit me like a brick, because I often heard people talk about my father. Oh, he just plays a piano like that because that's the only way he can play. When I knew that he did what genius do. What a genius does is they, they suck up all 
all the information that has preceded them, all the information that has preceded them, and they process it differently from us regular people. Yes. Right on. Yes. And when they process it, right, they come up with some new shit. And I'll finish. Thelonious not only figured out that this way of playing gave them some new rhythmic stuff, but, and this is what's critical, I used to tour with my father. One day he's playing a Steinway 10 foot grand. The next day he's playing an upright. The next day he's playing a Wallace, a Wurlitzer, and now he's playing a Johnson and Johnson. Right? And they all sound the same. Why? Because Thelonious was a sound guy. And, he, uh, and, the, and when you listen to his records, you hear that sound that Thelonious has. And sometimes somebody will play a Thelonious Monk live, and you say, That's, they're monkish, but that ain't the sound that Thelonious got. And that way of playing with his flayed fingers was how he got his sound that differentiated him from everybody else. And right now, to this very day, and I don't say this because I'm his son, I say it because it is a fact. You can go to Japan, you can find a Miles clone, you can find a Coltrane clone, you can find a Whitten Kelly clone, you can go to Europe, you can find a Max Roach clone and an Art Blakey clone, but there is nowhere on the planet Earth that you can find anybody. Being that I was four years, or maybe up until he retired, I spent a lot of time with him. But the dancing is the most important thing. He would leave the bandstand, come back to the kitchen, and dance and dance. And when Charlie Rouse get ready to finish his last eight bars, he would weave his safe way through, and I never Ooh. missed a <laughs> Never missed a you know? And that, that, so, but he danced because he was enjoying the music. And, and, and really, that's what I, I witnessed that, you know? He would be, he'd be back in the kitchen, dancing, and you know, everybody's playing, he's just moving and dancing, dancing. And then when it's time to, he's like, get up, oh, da 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 And another thing I just want to say, the night he premiered Green Chimneys, he had the whole Vanguard audience standing up and dancing. And everybody was up dancing. He was, you know, I never saw that. At one time, he had everybody in the jazz club, British Vanguard, everybody sitting there. He had a up dance on that particular song. Oh, wow. oh. We want to thank two people. The first is Corrine Jennings. This, this gallery has actually shown the work of over, and I don't exaggerate, over 7,000 artists. Ooh. Okay. 
Jimmy. Oh, yeah, I was, um, at, when the show was at, no, this is for TS, actually, and I saw you one time at the um, Jazzmobile, yeah. and at the, the trolley, so I snuck behind and watched it, it was amazing watching you conduct the band from the drum kit, it was a great moment. But I was standing beside you, eavesdropping actually, when you had the uh, wire, wire center. And you were looking at a piece and you said, Dad would have loved those colors. And I said, I've always wondered, could you unpack that? Well, the colors were, if I look around, I can see it now. It's that, those tertiaries, the magentas and the aquamarines. And if I look around you right now, that's what I see. But could you tell us, maybe I heard you wrong, or could you tell us about your father's takes in no, terms of um, art? Uh, Polonius liked, uh, he liked colors, of course, you know, uh, as Dr. Jeffrey was saying, colors are very much a part of music, and particularly for those folks that don't see, that don't have their vision necessarily, they see, they, they see internally, they, they, they visualize colors through, through the sounds that come at them. And, um, you know, music has always been associated with colors. I mean, they have the blue, oh, yeah. you know? Uh, and I think that just Thelonious was just a way, as, as all, and, and this, I don't think this is uh, confined to just jazz musicians. I think all musicians, uh, regardless of what kind of music they're playing, color is an integral part of what they see when they create the music. It's just, it's just part of it, and I've never really known a musician that doesn't like color and doesn't sometimes use color mm -hmm. to describe the, 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 a particular music or a particular sound, you know. I mean, I've heard a cat say, hey man, like, wow, we gotta get this, like, like it's gotta get, we gotta get purple here. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and that may have to do with the key yeah. or a, pic, a particular tone within a chord, you know. So it's, it, Thelonious was just in tune. I mean, in many ways, Thelonious was sort of, the, and I think one of the things that makes us all celebrate him is that he was sort of the quintessential prototype for what every, uh, really almost every musician wants to be. I used to think it was just jazz musician, but once I heard Randy talk about how Thelonious really transcended jazz, I realized that, um, that he was a quintessential prototype for every musician, because in fact, every musician wants to write all the songs that everybody wants to play. And Thelonious has accomplished that. And every musician wants to play in a fashion that maybe nobody can copy. And we all know Thelonious accomplished that. But also, they would like to write those compositions and play in that fashion and do it in a way that moves the entire genre. You dig? And everybody wants to do that. So, and in order to do that, you have to be, you know, Thelonious used to say everything is happening all the time. And um, it's very interesting that although uh, the greatest society would say things like those guys can't read music or those guys do, the, do things automatically, the fact of the matter is if you look at the various types of musicians on the planet Earth, jazz musicians are the group that require, we require that we investigate every other kind of music. And so therefore, when you listen to the body of work by Duke Ellington, you find Asian colors in there, and African stuff in there, and European stuff in there, and, and Indian stuff in there, and Latin American stuff in there, and Southeast Asian stuff in there. You know, because that's, that it's, it's all connected. It's all really connected. So what Thelonious was talking about, and what I was talking about with Thelonious with color, is really generally something that's true for all musicians. Wouldn't you agree there? Oh, sure. Yeah, and uh, adding to that, when I, um, I, I, I actually play music, I actually see colors, you know, and, and, and all of my, my paintings, I have uh, some red in it because it's a passionate color, you know, and uh, blue, I mean, those are the primary colors, and I use them all in every painting, you know, some form of that, and I used to put on music, put on Thelonious music and paint to that because I'm feeling a certain way. And all of this, the expressions that you hear in music, I, I was just, I was listening, I was thinking about how much of, of a genius your father was because that, last, that piece I played was called Ugly Beauty. And when I was teaching elementary school, I wrote that song out for the elementary kids because it's a very, very clear, simple yeah. melody. It's not complicated at all. Mm -hmm. 
But now you play Twinkle Twinkle, you play some of the other songs, and you're going to have to practice days and nights and maybe years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still can't play it. Because that's why I'm saying he went from the very, very simple to the very, very complex smoothly. So you can find that, you know, it's just like that was such a genius thing. You know, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add that you, you, you said everything is happening all the time, but I wanted to add to that, that quote every Google Plex. Of a second, uh -huh. and he said everything is happening all the time. Every Google Plex of a second, right, right. and when I read that, I had to look it up. I had to look up what does Google Plex mean, yeah. mm -hmm. and guess what I used to look it up? Google. Google. <laughs> <laughs> and this was way before Google. Like he was saying. Right, right. Yeah. We gotta wrap it up. Dick, while folks are standing and getting themselves together, can you play us out? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in this exhibition, there's a book on the table and it has the artist's bios in it. You can, you can check that out. In addition to that, it's got the prices of all of the artwork. <laughs> because the artwork, most of it, is for sale. Okay? In connection with what they were talking about, colors, and then what we were saying, how these artists, this is personal. This exhibition is personal. And Monk has affected them personally. And has affected their artwork. Do you see that large piece of Monk back there? Lennox is the artist. Tell them how Monk's music affected your production of that piece. Okay, I'm just going to tell you how I selected my colors. In the beginning, when I got the basic um, photograph together, I had um, laid out a palette of um, just blues, different shades and tones of blues. And then um, the piece is named Evidence after a piece that Monk played. So every time I do an artist, a, a jazz artist, whatever, I play the music in the background. So when I played Evidence and the horns came in, then I definitely knew I had to change and get the horns represented. So I had to add a little, you know, red because that's what I heard. And when you guys were talking about playing music and, and seeing colors and all that, I was sitting in the back there shaking my head. I'm like, I guess that's what the next thing. So I, um, you know, swung my composition to the colors. Every time I heard him play something, you know, he'd play smoothly, then he'd go off to the side a little bit. So that's how I have my piece. And when you were singing about how the music comes and he translates it, that's a snippet. I was sitting back there again saying, that's a snippet. What, I, what I try to convey, when he gets the inspiration, it goes through him, and it comes out of his fingers. So, you guys, you know, we're all connected in there. Uh, you connected, for sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Exhibiting artists, please stand so we can salute you. Exhibiting artists, please stand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Armand Williams. I'm a 22 year old artist based out of Los Angeles. Um, I'm currently at Otis School of Art and Design, and I was introduced to this program by Ed Sherman and uh, Marsha Hogan. It's a, it's a beautiful honor to be a part of this. Uh, looking at Monk, it's just it's amazing because my introduction to Monk was uh, Miles Davis. Miles Davis relating to abstract painting and understanding this idea of improvisation and thought and work. And that led me to Monk, which was which is an amazing, amazing thing. So that leads me to the work, the work that I made for this show. So when when thinking about the work of the show, I, I, I strayed away from the idea of a traditional painting, which I usually do, because I thought Monk was so much more than just a painting. So I I thought Monk itself was like more of an experience. It was something that you experience and something that you actually process. So through that, I thought about the layers of Monk, the layers of 
Monk and what that meant to be Monk. So that separated into two different entities, which was Monk as the artist and the composer, which is um, symbolized by the compositions of music, which is 100 pieces of Monk also representing his centennial. And then also leads us to Monk as the family man and the more personal side, which leads us to the Red Wagon. The Red Wagon is, is a direct reference to Monk music, which was a personal favorite album, but also to the whimsical nature and the way that Monk approaches music, like the humor and the way that he actually approaches such a usually serious topic. And then also leading to the idea of family, which because in that actual album cover, that was his son's wagon. And then also inside of the wagon, I placed uh, sheet music of Ruby My Dear, which is referencing his wife. And I thought it was a, I thought it was a beautiful touch just to, just to highlight those people that were important in his life and kept him who he was. So this is called Blue Monk in My Dreams, and it was made for the exhibition in particular. Um, it is a quilt. It's made from all textiles with some cowrie shells on the bottom. It is a more traditional piece, and there's some seminal piecing in it. There's some some petite fabrics, very few African fabrics. I usually don't use African fabrics in my work because I want to feel what it was like for my ancestors to come to this to this part of the world without their fibers and create something that appears to be African, so um, I use blue, of course, because yes, it's called Blue Monk in my dreams, but I love the song Blue Monk. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I love the song Blue Monk. Um, there's some traditional uh, uh, quilting. It's all machine quilted. I free motion, I free motion quilt which is a technique that some people are getting into now. Um, it's a lot faster to do once you've perfected it, but it is when you drop the feed dog in your sewing machine, for those of you who sew, and you just basically draw with the needle. So it's like you're doing like maybe three or four things at a time. Okay, my name is Lennox Commission. Um, I'm an artist. I was born in um, the West Indies, St. Vincent, and I migrated to um, this country in 1972. I've had um, about a semester of formal training. I went to college for art, but um, I guess I wasn't patient enough and I wasn't drawing, so I got bored and I went to the service, came back. Not until later in life did I actually take up art in earnest. And um, this style was derived from the fact that when I first began to work, I couldn't paint, of course, because I missed those classes. So I had these color aid papers from class, so I decided being that the colors were already in place, I would just use them to build a picture. But in the process of doing that, it taught me to mix color, and um, I do other work, but this is really my favorite um, form of expression. And um, in the past, I've done abstract work, but not in this style. And I knew, always knew there was a time when I would mix my abstract with this form of expression. So, and another element within this is jazz, another love of my life. So when Ed called me um, to do a piece for Monk Centennial, I was, I was kind of honored. So in the background, I, the name of the piece is Evidence, and it's based on an actual piece of music that Monk played. And um, on the record that I have, he actually played with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers, so I incorporated that in there. And being that the piece is called Evidence, I didn't want to just throw it out in the open. I want for the viewer to come by and see a little bit of information every time they look at the picture. So um, there's um, the actual notation on the music, medium swing. This is a label, I don't know if you guys remember the Atlantic label. There's a little um, circular, it says side one, and then it says, um, Thelonious Monk. So as the viewer comes by, maybe they walk by a couple of times, they'll see actual evidence, and then the name of the song is Evidence. 
Um, the composition, this is my source of inspiration, the light. And it comes through here, it's filtered. He processes the information and it comes out in the sheet music. Because my concept as an artist is, um, artists are blessed in a way that they're able to take information from the air and formulate it to a point where others can understand. So this is the point at which he's inspired. It comes through him, he processes it, and then it comes out in the music. Um, one thing about being in this show and being able to present this music allows me to do is to meet people, you know, certain statures in life. And um, growing up playing monk music, and not even like imagining that one day I'd come in contact with Monk's son. So when the show opened and um, Thelonious Monk's son was standing across from me and I was shaking his hand, it's, this is actual jazz royalty. So in addition to being able to ex express myself, it has allowed me to come in contact with different people that I would never have imagined meeting. And um, I am honored to be a part of the exhibition in whatever small way I can. In addition, I'm just going to tell you a little bit on how I created my color scheme. When I began, my idea was just to have blues, different um, tones and hues of blues. But then when I play the actual song, which I do when I'm um, working on a particular person, I play the song Evidence. And when the music, when the trumpets, when the horns came up in the background, I knew I had to have a color that represented them. So I went back and added some lighter colors and, and some reds. And um, I. I hope you like it. Okay. I'm Adamola Lugbe Fuller. Um, let me repeat that because the name is so very special. It was given to me back in 1966 uh, at the height of the civil rights movement where there was a great movement here in this country to reclaim our roots. So in Harlem, in mid Harlem, West Harlem, uh, the Yoruba Temple came into being and the purpose of that particular institution was to restore our greatness and begin to look at the African faith system which is known as the Orishas uh, were being promoted and presented to the African American community as part of their reclamation of our roots. So that's how my name was given to me. It means, uh, Adamola means respect for the crown. My last name, Alugbe Fuller, means uh, Reaper of the Wealth of the Nation. I took that to mean that I had a mission to mine and bring as much as I could to uplifting our people through cultural expression. Uh, I'm a long time, I'm one of the founders of the New York chapter of the National Conference of Artists, which played a role in this exhibition through Ed Sherman, who also helped found that chapter with me. So, you know, uh, and I have a long history of this gallery, uh, knowing Joe Overstreet from way back in the 60s when he came into Harlem with the uh, uh, Black Repertory Theater with the Mary Baraka. And then, of course, uh, I know Corrine for many, many years. We've served on panels together and uh, just a beautiful, beautiful couple. Um, this piece was done in Harlem in this century. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, it's fairly current in the sense that I completed it maybe three years ago or less. And uh, this is, it's called Stolen Moments. And it's from, inspired by the, uh, one of my favorite all-time albums, The Blues and the Abstract Truth by Oliver Nelson. But on that album, he featured Eric Dolphy, who is one of the all-time great instrumentalists. And uh, the reason I chose to put this in the show is because if you listen to, the, listen to that particular tune, um, Stolen Moments, uh, the hormonal and chordal structure were very heavily influenced by Monk. And uh, 
So I thought it was very appropriate for, for this to be part of it. And uh, there's not too much more to say except that it's a visual expression of that particular tune, that particular album, and uh, the work should speak for itself. I'm John Brathwaite and uh, a longtime photographer and I come from an artistic family. Uh, my father was a painter. My brother, oldest brother was Elame Brath, who uh, was Gil Noble's advisor and artist for the station, uh, Like It Is program. My middle brother, Kwame Brathwaite, was just honored by Aperture Magazine, and I've been shooting jazz and uh, other kinds of photography for about the last 40 years. This image of Eric Reed, uh, I call Round Midnight, it's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, it's a new area of jazz. I'm doing more than a straight picture, but an interpretation that shows a little about how I feel about the image and what it makes me feel about. So I hope that people will see it and enjoy it and uh, get a lot of appreciation out of the Round Midnight image. And thank you very much. My name is Otto Leos. I'm a painter, sculptor, and printmaker. And I have here a woodcut of a piece that I did of Colonial Monk for this wonderful, wonderful show. It's called Blue Monk. And I produced it in 2012, a few years ago. It's been a wonderful experience to be a part of the show and to uh, even more wonderful and pleasant to produce this woodcut of Dolores Smoke. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jimmy James Green. I'm here at Kinkilaba, and this is my work for the Monk Show. This is the third piece I've done. Uh, this one is called Round Midnight, and again, the first thing that I get from Monk is his um, originality. So I wanted to do something that was different. So this is a painting that has a collage underneath it. And um, I'm proud to be in the show. It's a really great collection of artists. Thank you. Wow. This is good. That's a wrap. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Today.